<clears throat> so good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night, depending on where you are in the world. As you can see, I am joined by none other than Dr. Brown, who I am I'm very pleased to have join us this evening. Um, we're going to skip the normal introductions because I have Dr. Brown only for an hour and I would like to squeeze as much out of that time as possible. So without further ado, we're going to begin with a prayer. And Dr. Brown, over to you to lead us in a psalm uh, for prayer, and then we'll begin. Wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll read uh, Psalm 1 as requested in Hebrew. <speaking in Hebrew> Truly happy is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scornful. Rather, his delight is in the teaching, the Torah of the Lord, and in his Torah he meditates, day and night, meaning recites, repeats, mutters, day and night. And he will be like a, a tree planted by streams of water, irrigation streams, who's who's um, always bearing fruit in its season, his leaf does not wither. Whatever he does succeeds. The wicked are not like this, but rather like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. They're sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous means is intimately involved with the derech hashayim toved, but the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm one, a wonderful opening to the whole book. Amen. Then, thank you very much, Dr. Brown. So we're going to be talking about um, Christ, the Church, and the Law. And with that, I'm I'm going to just say over to you, and um, I'll let you do your presentation, and I'll chip in with quite further questions or little comments um, whenever I feel like it, and we'll try and squeeze as much out of this hour as we can. Thank Sounds you so good. much. Over to you. Sounds good. So I, I want to read first a passage from the teaching of Jesus, Yeshua, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount has, has uh, been well known in the church over the centuries as some of the most foundational teaching of the Lord. And Many scholars believe that the Sermon on the Mount follows a, a, a structure for ancient Jewish preaching. Namely, uh, it begins with um, an introduction, in this case, the Beatitudes, uh, which just like Psalm 1 are the equivalent of Ashrei in Greek, Makarios, or in, in Aramaic, Tuvehon, truly happy, truly blessed, or the pure in heart, or, or the meek. Or, or the uh, etc. The poor in spirit. So the beatitudes. Then uh, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So Matthew five thirteen through sixteen. And now Matthew five seventeen to Matthew seven twelve. That's the heart of the message. The heart of the sermon. And then seven thirteen and after uh, enter the narrow gate. Beware false prophets. Build on the rock. That's the closing exhortation. Now, I, I bring all that out to say that 517 in Matthew mentions the law or the prophets, which is a comprehensive way of referring to the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible as a whole. Matthew 712 mentions the law and the prophets. These are like bookends in the Sermon on the Mount. So what, what the Lord teaches in, in Matthew 517 through 20 will now be opened up in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to show us the way. So he says, do not think I've come to abolish the Torah of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Whatever reason he said that, it must have been because there was so much new about him, so much authority with which he spoke, that he was making clear, I'm, I'm not undoing the foundation, I'm building on the foundation. And remember, if he had come, and abolish the Torah, then the Jewish people would have known for sure that he was not the Messiah. So he said, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So there, there, there are two untils. There's heaven and earth passing away 
and until everything is accomplished. Much of the fulfillment is accomplished in an ongoing way, which I'll explain. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. There's great debate about the meaning of these commandments. And we know for sure that there are things as followers of Jesus, whether we're Jew or Gentile, that we are not required to do today. For example, if there was a temple standing in Jerusalem, we would not be going there to offer sacrifices because we recognize that the sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross fulfills the purpose and goals of the sacrificial system, fulfills the purpose and goals of the Day of Atonement, fulfills the work of priestly ministry as Jesus becomes our great high priest. We know, for example, that uh, even if we had governing authority, we would not be putting people to death today for failure to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, we would not be burning a sorceress, etc. So we recognize changes have come, but they've not come by abolishing, but by fulfilling. So as, as we meditate on these things, and I'm going to be very practical in a moment, I'm just laying out the concepts first. As we meditate on these things, number one, we see that everything having to do with our approach to God, sacrifice, offering, atonement, cleansing, has been accomplished through the Messiah's work on the cross. That, that's a large bulk of Torah legislation. When it comes to the moral commandments of the Torah, we'll now see as Jesus speaks of these commands that he's really speaking about what he is now articulating. He's showing us the way. So he takes the moral commands of the Torah in terms of conduct one towards another, in terms of marriage, in terms of sexual purity. And he takes us to a higher level. Everything having to do with the calendar of Israel finds its fulfillment in him. The spring feasts in terms of Passover, unleavened bread, uh, first fruits. Are we still there? Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm still here. Okay, that was very, just, very odd. This, everything went, what went dark for a second. So oh. everything having to do with the Israelite calendar, um, the, the spring feasts were already fulfilled in his death and resurrection, sending the spirit, right? So Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and then Pentecost. Everything having to do with the fall feasts. So trumpets, his return, national atonement for Israel, in gathering of the nations. So trumpets, and then atonement, day of atonement, and then tabernacles. That will all be fulfilled in his return. These are some of the nuances of, of what we understand through the teaching and life and ministry of Jesus. But here's what's important. I mentioned 517, law or the prophets. 712 urges us to do to others what we would have done to us for this sums up the law and the prophets. Yeshua is now saying, I'm giving you the ethical application. I'm showing you how to live these things out. And when it comes to the specifics of the Sinai covenant that were given to Israel, number one, they were never given to the world as a whole. God never required all nations to keep the dietary laws, for example. He never judged foreign nations for violation of the dietary laws, but he did judge Israel for these things. So what we see is that the Sinai covenant, which was given to Israel, for a specific purpose, reached its goal, and because of human failure, was replaced by the new and better covenant. That is now articulated in the New Testament writings. This is now what God calls us to. This does not abolish what comes before, but brings it to its fulfillment, brings it to its goal. And now, as followers of Yeshua, God has written on our hearts to love one another. He has written on our hearts not to commit adultery. He's written on our hearts not to steal. He's written on our hearts uh, to, to do various things. And then as we grow in him, because we are in an in-between stage, right? The messianic era has begun, but will not come to its fullness until he returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth, until he returns and we are resurrected. So we are still in an already and not yet phase. The kingdom has broken in, but it's not fully here. So we have these things written in our hearts, 
And yet we are not 100% perfectly renewed at this point. We still have to grow in grace and grow in knowledge and abide in the Lord to see the fullness of his life. You say, okay, that's all very flowery, very nice. What does it actually mean? Number one, it means that for Jewish people, there's nothing that Jesus ever taught that says you should stop being Jews. That was never the issue. He did not come to make Jews into Gentiles and Gentiles into Jews. That was not his purpose. That was not his goal. And and there's nothing in the New Testament that indicates that. In, In fact, while there's no Jew or Gentile in Messiah, in the same way there's no male or female, we still have men's rooms and ladies' rooms in our congregations. We still have men's meetings and ladies' meetings. In the same way, it means there is no caste system. There is no class system. We're all one and equal in Messiah. But it, but Paul's explicit in 1 Corinthians 7. When you're called to the Lord, if you were circumcised, don't become uncircumcised. If you were uncircumcised, don't become circumcised. In Acts 15, the great debate among Jewish believers was what happens to Gentiles who come to faith. Do the men need to be circumcised? Does everyone need to be immersed and now take on the yoke of the Torah? Or does God have other requirements for Gentiles? There was never a debate about Jews. In other words, Jews continued to live as Jews. And to this day, there are Jewish believers who in covenantal solidarity with their people say, well, God gave us a calendar. There's no reason not to keep it. And and God gave us a, a, a Sabbath on the seventh day. There's nowhere in the New Testament where it's changed to the, to the eighth day or to the first day of the week. So we continue to live as Jews. But this is not for salvation or justification. It is simply in covenant solidarity with our people and to continue to be a witness to our people in in the midst of the world and in the midst of the Jewish community. At the same time, God never required Gentile believers to observe a Seventh-day Sabbath and to judge them for that. Paul Strong in Colossians 2, don't let anyone judge you over that. And in Romans 14, dealing with a community of Jewish and Gentile believers together, Paul makes clear that you're going to have some differences, but. Yep. Still here. Yeah. This is very, I I have no clue what's going on here. I've never seen this actually. um, Are you having problems? Cause you're, you're on screen for me. You've not disappeared at all. Yeah. It's just every so often everything goes black. Normally if you have a power outage, everything's gone. But yeah, hey, hey, listen, we're spiritual people. It must be demonic resistance to this amazing teaching, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, <Go> so <laughs> it, yeah, and for your viewers, I told you uh, before we started that somehow I, I woke up with uh, uh, some kind of allergies this morning. So if, if I'm tearing up or touching my nose, it's, it's not because I'm emotional, but because I'm fighting off a little allergy here. Okay, so back to Gentile believers. Uh, yes, if you say... Well, God gave the dietary laws for a reason. I, I, I'm i going to keep them. You're free to do that, but it doesn't make you more spiritual. And Jesus has taught that it, what defiles you is not what goes in the mouth, but what comes out of the heart, and that nothing in itself is unclean. At the same time, if a Jewish believer says, you know, uh, uh, it, it's my culture and background to observe the dietary laws, and it's a good witness in my community to do it, to say, hey, you don't stop being Jewish when you come to follow Jesus. Wonderful. Just understand that if you were out in some remote village somewhere in, in, in Africa sharing the gospel and they gave you some pig meat to eat, if you ate the pig, it's not going to defile you spiritually. It's not going to hurt you. So we relate to things differently. And when Paul says in Romans 6 that we're not under the law, he means we're not under the condemnation of the law. So uh, if, if, if you fall short in some way, there is grace and forgiveness and repentance through the cross. We are not under the law as a system of justification. And we are not under the law, according to Galatians 3, anymore as, as a schoolmaster or a guardian to bring us to the Messiah because we've come to him. In that sense, the, the law was like a scaffolding as the building was being erected. And now that it's erected, that scaffolding is unnecessary. So the way it breaks down simply is this. If a Gentile believer wants to know, what must I do to please God? 
what are the commands he wants me to keep? What are the things that he wants me to do? Well, read the New Testament. It's all there. You say, yeah, but aren't there commands in the Old Testament that are applicable also? Yes, but number one, they'll normally be reinforced in the New Testament. And number two, they will be laid out as universal in principle in the Old Testament. So, for example, the laws against incest or the laws um, uh, prohibiting homosexual practice or the laws against bestiality, these are listed in Leviticus 18 as universal laws. God judged the Canaanites for violating these things. How much more will he judge God's people for violating them? So unless something is laid out as a universal principle in the Old Testament, like do not murder, laid out at the foundation of the human race in Genesis 9, and whoever sheds human blood by man shall his blood be shed because we're created in the image of God, uh, unless it's laid out universally, and in this case reinforced through the rest of the Bible and throughout the New Testament, then if you simply are reading the New Testament for understanding what is God requiring of me, you'll find everything there. For a Jewish believer, you'll recognize that the, the very foundation of your faith is found in the Hebrew Scriptures, that everything that the Torah and the prophets were pointing towards now find their culmination in Yeshua, and that Jewishness and Jesus go hand in hand. We may end up discarding many traditions that a traditional Jew finds to be sacred and beautiful. We would either find to be binding or contrary to the spirit or contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. But our essential calling as being part of Israel remains. And the diversity within the body, Jews living a certain way, Gentiles living a certain way, all of us holding to the fundamental spiritual and moral beliefs and teachings of the Bible, that diversity is our unity, just like the diversity of a football team where you've got a, the goalie is not the striker and the, and the defenseman is not the goalie. And it, it's that diversity that makes them one. The same thing with an orchestra. It's all the different instruments coming together that we have this diversity within the body uh, holding to the same fundamentals while having diversity and expression in other secondary matters. What we often do is we make the secondary the primary, and, and we, we find our identity in being, um, we find our identity in being, say, Jewish or Gentile or part of this group or that group, as opposed to finding our identity being in Jesus, in Yeshua, in Christ, and everything flowing out of that. So that's, that's a general presentation. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and ask and dig more deeply and we can we can parse things out as we go. Brilliant. And, and firstly, I just want to say thank you. That was a, a very clear presentation uh, and a very informative as to our understanding of, of Jewish Gentile relationships within the church and also uh, our relationships to the law. Now, in, in the kind of work that I do, there are certain themes and questions that come up. So I'm, I'm going to throw those at you. These are these are questions that are thrown at me by people who are objecting to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So the questions yeah. may seem like I'm objecting to your presentation yeah, yeah. or objecting, but I'm actually just getting your feedback on 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 the on other people's sort of arguments. Yeah. Um, but but before we do that. I, I do want to just touch on the rabbinic tradition and the law of Moses, mm -hmm. because as I understand in my own readings of the Gospels, it does appear that Christ had a, um, a beef, as it were, with the Pharisees in the sense of <clears throat> they had gone beyond what the law of Moses had required. Uh, and one of the debating points was between the human traditions that the Pharisees had created and, and what the law of Moses meant. So how... As a Messianic Christian, how, how do you relate to sort of rabbinic tradition and Pharisaic tradition versus the Torah law? Right. So first, so everyone understands, rabbinic Judaism believes that when God gave the Torah on Mount Sinai, he gave it in two forms, written, Torah Shebikhtav, the Torah that is in writing, and oral, Torah Shebaalpeh, the Torah that's on the mouth. And... Uh, they believe that without the oral Torah, it's impossible to understand the written Torah. Uh, so, for example, where it says, don't do any work on the Sabbath, whoever works will be put to death. It doesn't specifically define work. 
or where it says, you know, to have these uh, as a sign on, on your on your forehead, etc. It doesn't tell you exactly how to construct the the box where you you put the the scripture verses. Now, some would say, well, you're you're presupposing a lot even to make those statements, but that's that's in rabbinic thinking. Uh, so the principles of interpreting all the commandments were given to Moses and passed down. The understanding of what they meant according to rabbis, given especially on Mount Sinai in his time there and then passed down through the generations, and then developed over the generations, meaning a new situation arises because now you're living in the promised land, or a new situation arises because of some technological development. Um, therefore, new questions come up, or new applications of law come up. So the, the Jewish leaders in each, uh, in each uh, community would now develop new laws, develop new customs, and then these would be, become part of this oral tradition as well that is being passed on from generation to generation. So uh, just as you can't understand Catholicism just based on the New Testament, because it would say, no, we have New Testament and church tradition, and the church tradition is authoritative and inspired, etc. The same thing with rabbinic Judaism. If you ask a traditional Jew, well, why do you pray at these times of the day? I don't see that specifically in the Bible. Or what do you say these words when you pray? Or what do you wear this? What do you wear a head covering? I don't see that specifically. They say, well, that, that's part of the oral tradition, and that to them is just as authoritative as what's written. Now we know for sure that different traditions developed over the years. That's inevitable. Every community has that. Every religious community. The question is, are they good traditions or bad traditions? And the question is, are they inspired or not? For sure. Um, by the time you get to the first century, you had different competing Jewish traditions. We even though in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so well over a century before the time of Yeshua, uh, one of the famous documents called 4QMMT, which, which deals with different uh, disputes. There's the Pharisaical understanding of Sabbath and other laws. There's the Qumran sectarians and their view. We know the views of the Sadducees were different. So, so you, have, you have this whole controversy going on. The traditions were definitely there. Um, and, and it may be that Jesus had his issue with the Pharisees because he was closer to them. That's why there was more conflict. Others would say he was exactly opposed to them. But for example, going to the synagogue, that was a Pharisaic innovation. And we know Yeshua did that. He went to the synagogue. Uh, there were other things he did that would have been in keeping with, with the developing oral traditions. But his issue was where the traditions went beyond the word or they contradicted the spirit of the word or they contradicted the letter of the word. And that was his great issue. And that would be my issue. I would recognize many beautiful traditions in rabbinic Judaism. I would recognize how these traditions have become sacred to traditional Jews. Uh, as, as they've often said, as I've interacted with rabbi friends, that the holiness for a traditional Jew is found in the details. So the very things that we might find binding, for example, uh, this is a reminder uh, as I deal with these allergies, that in 1975, I spent Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, with an ultra-Orthodox family in Brooklyn. And I, we were getting ready to walk over to the synagogue where we were going to be for, uh, for the day, uh, praying, etc., through the entire day, we were we are on our way over to the synagogue. All right, here we Still are. Here. Still yeah. here. So we we were on our way over to the synagogue, and I was grabbing a bunch of tissues, and they said to me, "Oh, oh, you can't take those with you. You can't carry. And this is the Sabbath. You can't carry on the Sabbath." I said, "Carry? I mean, there's no there's no weight." with tissues. There's no burden with it, which was the whole emphasis of Jeremiah 17. Don't work on the Sabbath. Don't carry any loads, right? But this is how far it went in rabbinic Judaism. I thought, okay. And they said, but don't worry, they're pre-ripped tissues in the bathroom in the synagogue, from which I learned that that ripping was also now violating the, the law, according to the rabbis. Now, to me, that seemed depressive. And in, in, in their minds, it's something very beautiful and sacred and, and their way of honoring God. So I'm not criticizing those who revere the traditions. I'm simply saying that I would reject them for the same reason that Yeshua did. Either they're adding something to what God originally said in a way that does create a burden, or they're taking away things 
because of human ways of thinking, or they are violating specific scripture verses or the spirit of, of the word. And that, that's what Jesus takes issue with, for example, when he has a dispute about healing on the Sabbath. That, yeah, a, a, if you're a doctor, then you don't work on the Sabbath uh, unless it's an emergency situation. That would be Jewish tradition. And I would think that's, yeah, that's good. Sound. You're a Sabbath keeping religious Jew and you're a doctor. So you don't go into the office, you don't practice um, on the Sabbath. But what if there's emergency? Someone faints in the synagogue and you don't, and, and they need CPR immediately. Well, now you, now you do your job to save a life. Um, we understand that. So the principle was, well, you could heal any other day, come back another day and heal. Whereas Jesus is saying, you're missing the greater purpose of the Sabbath, which is to set captives free and to bring liberation and to bring rest. What a perfect day to do it. So that's where the conflict would arise for me. Not that traditions exist, but they have taken authority over the word and over the spirit. And mm -hmm. that's a principal area of conflict I would have with the rabbinic community. Volume five of my series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, just focuses on these issues of the, of the authority of the oral law. It's not to bash traditional Jews. It's simply to say, I question the authority by which you do what you do. Got it. That that's that's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much. Um, which which kind of brings us on because you mentioned at the back end of that answer, you know, the idea of setting the captives free, and you've stated that, and you've stated that, um, you know, Jews should keep um, the laws of Moses, uh, who who believe in the Messiah, when it comes to the moral laws. So, uh, where does slavery sit in? to that dynamic and as a messianic jew how do you square following the messiah the torah's teaching about slavery and um and you know our, our abolition uh, of slavery yeah so number one we're not under the sinai covenant and that was sinai covenant and number two we see that the goal was always liberty and freedom that that the ideal was to remember you were slaves in Egypt and you've been set free. Therefore have mercy on others. Don't treat others the way you were treated. And hence uh, Hebrew servitude was, was far different than it would have been in ancient Egypt or as practiced in the UK and England, the, the, the horror of the African slave trade that was never countenanced in the Hebrew Bible. And well, the Arab slave trade for that. Moment. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it, exactly. So, uh, I'm only mentioning that because Christians were, were involved in, yeah. in that. Yeah. So the, the point is, number one, it was under the Sinai covenant. Number two, it was never the goal or the ideal any more than divorce was the goal or the ideal. Jesus himself said certain commandments like that. Divorce were given because of the hardness of, of the heart. But God's goal was one man united with one woman for life. That was the ideal. So the new covenant brings about the ideals, and, and that's what we're – moving towards if i simply practice love your neighbor as yourself and live that out that i can't i can't practice slavery at the same mm -hmm. time now mm -hmm. does that mean that i can't employ someone to work for me as as a household servant you know and i, I treat them well and they're free to come and go but they don't make the money that i make well that, that's just the normal system of life you know you you make what you're qualified to make but then you're generous and help others uh, so the New Testament did not have the power to set a new social system that would overthrow the system of Rome, but it laid out principles by which slavery would ultimately be abolished. And even the principle yeah. that uh, there's no uh, slave nor free in Jesus would mean that potentially the slave could be an elder in a congregation that the master attended. Uh, yeah. and, and soon enough, you have a system that that demolishes the very strongholds of slavery. Uh, so, so the New Testament principles now will undo slavery themselves. But again, we're not under the Sinai covenant. Uh, Yeshua has taught us a better way now. Just, just, just a very quick clarification. This doesn't need a long answer at all. Um, when you say Sinai covenant, is that for you the same as saying the Mosaic covenant or do you see the- Yeah, Sinai Sinai covenant, you... Mosaic covenant the same, but that's not the same as yeah. saying the Torah. The Torah refers right. to five books of Moses as a whole and then to the legal content uh, mm. with, within the Sinai Covenant. Much of that legal content is renewed in the New Covenant. 
Yeah, I got that. I got that. So, so one of the questions that that, that often um, Christians, Christians with one another, Christians <laughs> with Jews, and maybe Christians with Messianic uh, Jews discuss is um, the idea of the Sunday. Uh, obviously, the Gentile Church back centuries ago adopted a Sunday as a, a Sabbath. Um, and or at least adopted it in the sense of of treating it like a Sabbath. Um, w- w- how do you view that? And it, do you feel that there's anything wrong with Gentiles treating the Sunday like a Sabbath? Um, it, uh, like, what 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 what's your thoughts on that whole idea of Sunday as a day of rest? Right. So number one, nowhere does the New Testament set aside Sunday as a holy day or a day of rest or intimate that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. That's that's the first thing. Number two, nowhere is there a command for Gentile believers in the New Testament to worship on Sunday. Yes, the Messiah is resurrected on the first day of the week. Yes, in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul tells believers to put aside money the first day of the week. He's just saying start your week by putting aside funds for a special offering. It's not that that's when they you had their Sunday service and he's telling them, make sure you, you bring your, your, uh, your, your tithe to the Sunday service. I mean, they would, would have looked at like, what are you talking about? Um, so there's no new Testament command for this, but there's certainly new Testament liberty for it because God never explicitly commanded the seventh day Sabbath for the, uh, God never explicitly commanded the seventh day Sabbath for the, uh, the Gentile church. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, Romans 14 makes clear that there's liberty in terms of sacred days and celebrations. And number three, ultimately, we find rest in Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, we come to him and find rest. That's the ultimate Sabbath rest that we're looking forward to that, that Hebrews even speaks of as well, which is a rest in him. So there's no problem with the tradition developing just like Jewish traditions developed, there's no problem with Christian traditions developing where it seems fairly early on in the church, Sunday became a sacred day. Believers would gather before work or after work to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We, we have attestation of this really within the first century uh, for, from best I can tell. So these traditions began to develop when it became full blown, when it became, this is the day of rest, this is the Sabbath, as long as there was not the belief that the church had authority to create a new Sabbath, that's that's a major error that took place in the fourth century. And that was part of now uh, severing the Jewish roots of the faith as if the seventh day Sabbath was no longer relevant. So if someone says to me as a Christian, am I required to keep a seventh day Sabbath? No, but you're free to. Uh, can I celebrate Sabbath on, on Sunday and, and honor that as the Lord's day? God bless you. Do it to honor him. And the principle of the Sabbath is important just in terms of our physical life and and rejuvenation. Uh, But Mm. the degree of ink spilt over this and the degree of passion and arguments either way on it, that to me is the biggest error, that it's it's not something that we are supposed to be fighting over and dividing over. And Paul, Paul's quite explicit about, you know, not judging another man's servant on questions such as this. Um, and I, I, I think it, it's useful to hear this question, particularly because, as you've said, there's been a lot of ink spilled on, on, on this question. A lot of people yeah. have fallen out over this question. And and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's good to hear the, the, the clarity of the liberty of the gospel, allowing, uh, allowing Gentile Christians to honor the Sunday to the Lord if they so wish and so choose. Um, yeah, I, I, so, so moving on, um, one of the questions, um, that I think needs to be spoken of because in, in the premise of your presentation is this idea of, um, you know, the, the Jews should keep those parts of the covenant that, that continue into the new covenant, uh, from the, the Mosaic covenant. Um, so like the moral laws, for example, but they don't need to keep, for instance, things like the sacrificial laws, i.e. our way to God is is fulfilled and our way of the, the way for Messianic Jews is to continue in the, the, 
the moral, ethical teaching, as are the Gentiles. Am I right in understanding that? Yeah, so the question would be, does God command Jewish believers to keep the, the identity markers of Israel, like the Seventh-day Sabbath, for example, or the dietary laws? Is it a command? Well, we would all agree it's not for our justification, that those mm. things do not save us. We would all agree on that. But there is a debate among Jewish believers as to whether it's a matter of personal calling. In other words, God calls one to be part of a Messianic congregation that meets on Saturday and that is much more Jewish in its orientation. And God calls another to be part of a Sunday morning church. Uh, one of them celebrates Passover and the other celebrates Easter. Uh, some would say it's a matter of calling. Others would say, no, these are just the signs of how far we have departed from our Jewish roots, because we know the apostles continue to live as Jews. We know by Acts, the 10th chapter, Peter had still not eaten anything uh, non-kosher, hadn't dawned on him to do that, right? Paul was still going in the synagogues and preaching him. He couldn't have just showed up there if he was living a foreign alien life. Um, and, and then you have for centuries, Jewish believers who are Orthodox in every way, continuing to live as Jews. And the church leaders didn't really know what to do with them uh, because conscious decisions had made, you know, in, in the Nicene Council under Constantine, a conscious decision was made to sever Passover from Easter so that there would be no mm. connection to the Jewish calendar. Um, so what I would say is it's healthy for the whole church to reconsider the Jewish roots of the faith and to ask how some of the unnecessary separations came about so that ideally the death and resurrection of Jesus are celebrated during the Passover season as they would have been in the first century and, and by much of the church and, until that, that final split came with, with Constantine. Um, and then for individual so, Jewish believers, they need to work things out between them and God. I do believe there is a calling on us as Jews but how that works out is going to be different in different lives. So I, I fully affirm my Messianic friends who feel the importance of a more outward Jewish identification uh, as part of a historic calling and to preserve things for their children and future generations and to be effective witnesses in the midst of their Jewish community, not just as an outward show, but by inward conviction. I simply don't believe we can find a New Testament mandate for all Jewish believers to live in that same way, that even there among Jewish believers, there'll be diversity. Some in churches, some in Messianic congregations, some in what looks much, much more outwardly Jewish, some of what looks more outwardly Christian. Uh, and there'll be that diversity within Messianic Jews as well. So, so, so building on that, so if, 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 if both Jews and Gentiles are obliged to keep the um, the moral and ethical law, given that in Romans it speaks about the Gentile church being grafted on to the 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 the, the root of Jesse, mm -hmm. the root of the the Israel nation, one of the arguments that often gets thrown at evangelists like myself is. Well, why aren't we keeping the rest of the Jewish law then? Because if we're, if we, if part of the new covenant means that we have to keep the ethical law along with Jews, and we're grafted into the confederacy of Israel, why then do we not, for instance, need to keep food laws or Sabbath laws? I know you have yeah. kind of addressed this already, but I, I just want you to more directly address it yes. through the prism of what it says in Romans. Right. So. Number one, some of those things were specific identity markers for the Jewish people. And Acts 15 makes clear that the Gentiles coming in did not have to take on those identity markers. They now had equal status without those. That's, that's part of the great revelation. Though you don't need to do these other things. When the word gets out, there's great joy in the Gentile Christian community. Because some of those people had been in the synagogue. They worshipped the God of Israel, but they did not convert to Judaism and take on the whole yoke of the Torah. Now they're being told you have equal status with the Jewish believers and equal access to God without having to take that on. So this is what happens now in the new covenant is the barrier comes down between the two. That's the very nature of it. So I would argue that the new covenant in its essence does not renew 
mandatory dietary laws, one of the purposes of those was to separate Jew from Gentile. So if you the, the whole thing with Peter's revelation, I don't think God was talking to him about food. He was talking to him about Gentiles, right? And the food laws were symbolic of that. In, in, in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, after Jesus makes plain that what you eat doesn't defile you, but what comes out of your heart defiles you, he then goes from there to a Canaanite woman. He, it's probably a round trip of about 60 miles. Think of walking 30 miles in each direction just to heal the daughter of a Canaanite woman, a Syrophoenician woman, and then he comes back. It, it, he was now living this out where he was, he was not calling unclean what used to be unclean. So this is the very nature of the new covenant. This is the fulfilling of the purposes of the Torah, which now find their goal in the Messiah and that we are now one family in one kingdom and with e each bringing our own diversity into it. So I would argue that the very essence of the new covenant is the barriers are removed. And then this diversity of expression through the Messiah, we can all know God equally. And does that does that mean so so going to Peter and the, the vision in Acts, um, where where the blanket comes down with the unclean foods and he's commanded to eat, you you interpret that as being about him going to the Gentiles. Does that mean that he can then eat the food of the Gentiles? That he can eat unclean foods? Well, Is that certainly. How you saw that? See, here's the principle, and this this comes from the Gospels. In principle, you now understand that eating unclean food doesn't defile you because it's a physical thing and defilement is a spiritual thing. So that's the whole point. It doesn't mean you go out and do it, right? But if you have to do it, it doesn't defile you. And for Gentile Christians, that, that was never a command that was given. The food laws were, were never a command that was given to them. That was, again, part of the Sinai covenant with Israel. So that's why I say, even though Jesus already taught that in the Gospels, didn't dawn on Peter to go uh, and kill a pig and eat it, right? Why mm -hmm. would that have dawned on him? He still would think of it as it's unclean. However, now he understands, hey, I can go to the Gentiles. They, I shouldn't call them unclean. And if they serve me food I wouldn't normally eat, it's not going to defile me to eat it. So that spiritual principle would be understood. He still may have kept kosher his whole life whenever possible, but he understood that the food doesn't defile me. It doesn't bring, as Paul wrote, doesn't bring us close to God. Doesn't bring us away from God. What about what about if um, uh, sorry, uh, what what about if a gen? So I've 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 debated and, and talked to people who who have have tried to say that now that you're a Christian, you have to keep the Torah for salvation. And and your presentation is very clear that you, you obviously don't agree with that. Um, and, and neither do I, just for the record. Um, but what happens if a Gentile decides that they want to keep Torah laws, like a part, in the same way that a Messianic Jew might, if they decide to adopt uh, Messianic customs and traditions in sort of eating certain foods and keeping the Sabbath as a holy day, uh, do you do you feel that Gentiles should shouldn't? Or would you caution them against or caution them for? Where, where do you stand on that kind of spectrum? I would, I would caution them against for the following reasons. Uh, I've observed now over 50 years plus in the Lord that it's often a path to backsliding and confusion for many. That they now begin to, uh, well, what about the new moons? And well, what about this ritual purity law here? And, and, and what about, the, and, and how do I work this out? Um, many years ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me about, quote, the Jewish temptation, meaning the, the pull to want to be Jewish. And, and the word I received from the Lord was that the whole Jewish temptation is in the soul realm. It will complicate, excuse me, it will fascinate, stimulate, complicate, suffocate. And one of the top Messianic Jewish leaders in the world who I've known now for, oh, well over 30 years, um, he, he told me that he has seen that come to pass over and over, as I have as well. It will fascinate, stimulate, complicate, suffocate. So be on your guard. I've seen increasingly the people that go in that direction are not Jesus-centered. Many will, you can't even use that name, Jesus. The idea of worshiping him as God, they begin to fall away from that. Sharing their faith, they're, they're more talking about the, the Torah than they are the Son of God. 
and they'd say, well, he is the Torah. Uh, their worship life begins to deteriorate, etc. So I've seen that over and over and over. It doesn't mean that the church can't effectively recover some of its lost Jewish roots. It certainly can. We swung in the other direction. Uh, but the other, the other issue is that uh, no, no Gentile Christian is really going to effectively keep the law. And, you know, for every commandment they're keeping, okay, well, what about this? 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 So you have to realize, okay, we're under a different system now. Even the rabbinic Jew recognizes that they can only observe the Torah in light of their traditions, right? You know, the, even if, if there was governmental authority in Israel today for Orthodox Jews to fully carry out the law, they wouldn't be uh, putting to death Sabbath breakers. There may be some kind of punishment, but they or they wouldn't be stoning a disobedient, rebellious teenagers who were unrepentant. In other words, they've developed traditions that kind of give loopholes and, and different ways of reading that. So uh, num number one, it is a, a backward spiritual spiritual progression. Number two, uh, it is it is impossible to do, and and only gets people tied up in in knots or in in religious self righteousness, and. And uh, number three, it hurts our witness to the Jewish world. You say, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. When Jews see Gentiles trying to live like Jews and look like Jews, you know, here's, here's a guy who decides he's going to grow a beard and maybe side curls. You know, well, it's in the law, right? You don't shave the beard. And, and well, you know, I, I see the fringes. I've got to wear fringes a certain way. And, well, biblically, they were this color, so I'm going to try to recreate this color. And then... A, a religious Jew meets them, then they think, "What? What are you?" You know, they'll they'll notice something's different if they if they look very similar. Within thirty seconds of talking to them, they'll realize they're Gentiles, and then when they find out they're they're followers of Jesus, it makes everything we do look like a sham. The the degree of damage that this has done to our witness to traditional Jews who already have massive issues with mm -hmm. with our message, the degree that it is. Um, fed into the perception that we are deceivers and superficial is more massive than people would know. Now, for a Christian to say, hey, I love the Jewish people, and I love being part of a Messianic congregation, and I find richness in worshiping with them on the Sabbath, and I find riches in, in the way they celebrate the Passover and the feast, wonderful. But be enriched, if you feel called to be part of a Messianic congregation, and the seventh day Sabbath becomes special too wonderful. So as a Gentile Christian, you're identifying with Israel and, and you are participating in that life flow. Wonderful. But don't try to become a Jew or look like a Jew and, and don't feel an obligation to keep all the commandments. That, that is a nullification of the blood of Messiah. If you feel that you're justified by that, Paul wrote to the Galatians, if righteousness could have come by the law, then Messiah died in vain. So it's it's one thing to say uh, we're doing this to be justified before God. That's heresy, and that's what Galatians is about. It's another thing to say uh, we feel called to do this as part of our identification with Israel, but we understand we're not Jews. Praise God. Wonderful. Uh, and then still it's another thing to say it's not for justification, but we believe it's essential uh, to obedience. That is also a, a, a slippery path. Hmm. So I, I just just you, you touched on it very briefly there. Um, could you talk a bit more about the law, the curse of the law, and the life of the spirit? Yes. Um, and, and particularly how Christ, uh, and in that, if you could also talk about how Christ becomes the curse of the law um, for us. Yes. So if we think the the very very small minority of of Christians who've gone astray thinking that they must observe the Torah in order to be justified before God. Uh, they don't realize the depth of their own sin, and they don't realize the fullness of the price that was paid on the cross. Ultimately, the law condemns all of us. None of us on our best day love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and love our neighbors ourselves. None of us do that on the holiest day we've ever lived. None of us do that perfectly. We all fall short. We all deserve death. We all deserve to be cursed by God. And Jesus takes that for us. Romans 8, what the law could not do because of the weakness of the flesh, Messiah did, right? Becoming a sin offering for us. So 
So he pays the full price for our redemption at the cross. The obedience that we live out afterwards is the fruit of our salvation. It is the proof of our repentance. It is not the means by which our sins are paid for. Those were paid for 100% entirely by the blood of the cross from beginning to end. And that remains our, our hope, you know, as the great Christian hymns emphasized, you know, uh, top ladies, uh, rock of ages, nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross I, I cling. Uh, naked come to thee for dress, helpless come to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That remains the hope of every Jew and Gentile in Jesus, Yeshua. At the same time, we know that we now live, Romans 7, not by the written code, but by the Spirit, which does not mean lawlessness, but it means that the righteous commandments of the Torah are now written on our heart for us to live out. And again, if you want to know what those are, they're reinforced throughout the entire New Testament. Amen. Um, I, 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 I'm, sadly, I'm, our, our time is, is quickly coming to an end. I've got you for yeah. about 10 more minutes. So I want to try and get as much out of this as possible. And there's so many topics and so many things we could talk about. Um, I'd love to have you back if, if at all at some point in the future. But like, at what, what, what in it, it, the, the fact is that the, obviously the church just numerically is overwhelmingly Gentile. Um, and so we've got a, a, a slight sprinkle of uh, Jewish believers in an otherwise ocean of Gentile believers. So in that dynamic, how best can Gentile Christians um, learn and support, um, learn from and support Messianic Christians? Um, and in that answer, if you could also maybe address the status of Messianic Christians and the position of Messianic Christians in Israel. Right. So we would refer to ourselves as Messianic Jews. Uh, Messianic Christians ah, yes. okay. would be yeah, 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 somewhat, somewhat redundant. That's, that's, okay. that's my slip. Yeah. yeah. So we refer to ourselves as Messianic Jews. Within Israel, there are at least 20,000 Jewish believers in the land. Some put the estimate as high as 30,000, but more, more likely closer to twenty. So uh, even if it's 30,000, uh, think of this, the Jewish population of Israel right now is about seven and a half million. So one-tenth of that would be 750,000. One-tenth one of that would be 75,000. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not even a half of a tenth of a tenth of percent of the population of Israel. On the other hand, at the founding of Israel in 1948, they were maybe a little over 10 known Jewish believers. So there has been rapid growth. There are many dozens, even, even hundreds of small congregations and some larger expressions. Um, on the one hand, Jewish believers are absolutely free to live as, as believers in the land. Uh, they're, they, they fight in the Israeli military. They serve in the communities. They work jobs like everybody else. Um, some of the shows like Britain's Got Talent or that kind of thing, the equivalent of that in, in uh, Israel, there have been a couple of Messianic Jewish uh, young ladies that have made it like way, way up there, and their testimonies have gotten out. So it's a known entity within the land. You can engage in evangelism and different things without restriction. On the other hand, the uh, government, as it leans further and further right, continues to give uh, power to uh, religious Jewish groups that really oppose us, that really uh, try, try to make life difficult for us. So there has been persecution over the, over the years. Sometimes the police haven't been as active as they could have been uh, in protecting Jewish believers. Uh, on, on the other hand, there is religious freedom still uh, in Israel. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, bless. You can You're really are having that. these allergy problems. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, I got to go from here to do my radio show. That'll be even more fun. But my uh, my <laughs> apologies. I was fighting that sneeze for the last one hour, but finally it happened. So that, gives, uh, that gives the critics a little clip to play over and over. If uh, those that yeah. want to attack me, we just gave you a little yeah. sneeze to deal with there. Um, yeah. But uh, there's increasing pressure on Jewish believers and and. Uh, for example, religious Jews will, will oversee the Ministry of Interior, and, and they can create 
issues, difficulties, especially for Messianic Jews seeking to come into the land. But that being said, there is religious liberty. You can meet freely. Uh, you can engage in open evangelism as a Jewish believer living in the land. Worldwide, there's a, a variance in terms of, of estimates as to how many Jewish believers there are worldwide. Certainly at least 150, 200,000. It could be as high as 300,000. And then if you include Hebrew Christians uh, in the Catholic Church, the numbers go up. Interestingly, though, uh, as many as 25 or 30 percent of millennial Jews in America believe that Jesus is the Son of God or something along those ways, not in a saving wow. way, but just in a in a religious way. So mm. this would reflect that many of them have been raised in non-religious homes and are therefore more open to these things. Um, and then among the, the very religious Jews, the ultra-Orthodox, it's a tiny trickle of secret believers uh, because they'd lose everything uh, in being known and some of them are, are seeking. So we just do our best to encourage and pray for them and, and help in, in whatever ways that we can. Uh, what, what, what then uh, would you say to any uh, anyone from a Jewish background who's watching this, whether they be secular Jewish, uh, whether they be religious Jewish, uh, and, and perhaps they're considering the claims of the Messiah, and they are are, are, are reading uh, a, a gospel? What, what would you want to say to, to people who might be watching it from that kind of perspective. Yeah. So let me share this. And this, uh, this will have to be about my, uh, my last word here. I'd encourage every one of them to go to realmessiah.com, realmessiah.com. And you can watch their debates I've had with rabbis and hear both sides. You can watch videos where I refute counter missionary rabbis like Tobias Singer, uh, take apart their videos and show the extreme error that they're that they're putting forward. Uh, you can see their answers to the most common hundred or so objections to Jews believing in Jesus and other resources there that are free. So realmessiah.com. And I'd encourage Christians, believers from all backgrounds to go there as well, to check it out and to explore some of the riches to gain a greater burden to pray for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to learn more about church history and how the church has often mistreated Jewish people and how that's been a terrible, ba terrible barrier to sharing the good news with, with Jewish people, especially religious Jews who know their history. Um, and to ask God for his burden because uh, the, the burden for the salvation of Israel remains. Paul said he was continu in continual sorrow for his Jewish people's salvation. And he also said that the gospel is to the Jew first as well as to the Gentiles. So um, be in prayer for the salvation of Israel, be a friend to the Jewish people. And as you have the open door in relationship, uh, share your faith with them as, as they welcome you to do so. And everyone get educated at realmessiah.com. They can also support our work there if they like. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for your time. I've really appreciated and loved having you on. I should look up here, I've got to get into the habit. I'm looking down at you, but not at the camera. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And I do hope your radio show goes well. Um, awesome. And that you don't steal my audience that's now here. <laughs> All right. Well, no, that's an hour from now, but I've got to leave to get there. Well, God bless, man. Yeah. Good to see God you. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, uh, brothers and sisters, there you go. We've we've been blessed uh, and graced by the presence of Dr. Brown. He's given us lots of food for thought. Um, and now is an opportunity for us all to talk. And I'll take questions now. Um, I couldn't, I didn't want to take questions from the audience when I had specific things I wanted to talk to Dr. Brown about. And I only had him for an hour. So uh, forgive me, guys, for for not taking your questions but it was literally 60 minutes to the dot and um yeah we were already a few minutes late starting so there we go however now if there are any questions on any topic at all whether it be this one or something else but preferably on this topic um now's your opportunity do put at bob or i will ignore your questions um and um we'll take it from there guys um 
yeah, it's it's been a, a really interesting thing. I've learned some stuff that I didn't know, um, and, and we'll, we'll adopt um, some some new things that I've learned today. But I, I, I think it's pretty much um, understood that is the, the relationship between Gentiles and Jews within the church is that Jews are Jews, not just by ethnicity, but also by culture and religion. And so when they come to accept the Messiah, because that is intrinsic to their religion, they don't have to stop being Jewish. Um, uh, but they, as it were, to, to use my own words, they have to sort of modify the way that they practice Judaism. And I think that's fair that, like, scholars on Paul um, would not say that Paul would have seen himself as a, as converting to a new religion or founding a new religion. He would have seen himself as continuing in Judaism. Um, and the Christian church started as a Jewish movement and then broke out um, of that um, when Gentiles started to receive the spirit. Um, and one of the one of the, the the places in which the Jewish uh, the, the 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 Jewish Church kind of lost its Jewish roots was when Jewish Christians were kicked out of the synagogue, um, and I think as history progressed and as the church grew mainly amongst the Gentiles, obviously the Gentiles developed a Gentile church, and ultimately the the church as a whole. Is going to always remain Jewish, uh, sorry, Gentile in character, but that doesn't mean that um, Messianic Jews are not part of that. So let's have a look. Um, what are your thoughts on the Jews because they are idol followers and have dis disobeyed God through the Old Testament? Well, I mean, mm, I, firstly, I don't think they. I, I think I don't. Hmm. The question kind of assumes that Jews are idol worshippers and not everyone else. Um, I think it was I think it was Calvin, was it Calvin, um, that said that the, the 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 human heart is an idol factory, and that as human beings, our temptation is to create idols to worship, and we create idols all the time. Um, whether that be the idol of ourself or the idol of the nation or some statue or um, some particular, um, you know, some some particular um, uh, goal or ambition. Like all human beings create idols. Um, the thing is that the Jews did it under the scrutiny of the spirit of God that kept pointing out to them, look, you're doing idol worship, you're doing idol worship. The reality is that lots of Christians today are still practicing idolatry. Um, go into any American church and you will find an American flag um, and you will hear them celebrate things like American Independence Day. Go to the Philippines and you'll see um, Catholics um, treat um, little statues as if they've got some kind of magical power um go into orthodox churches and um you'll and, and meet go into orthodox communities and you'll meet orthodox christians treating the icon as if um as if somehow the icon itself is uh giving power none of it is justified in in scripture in the sense of treating the thing as an idol is contradicted by scripture whatever that thing is um and the reality is therefore that the if you have to answer your question directly um it means that jews are human just like the rest of us um and that just like the rest of us they need to make sure that their glorification is to the one god father son and holy spirit and that they are building their life around him so i hope that answers your question ronnie um you know and i i, I picked on christians for that answer gotta get in gotta, gotta get into the habit of looking up here um i i picked on christians to answer that question because 
in the context of our presentation, we're talking about believers in the Messiah, but I could just have easily pointed out the Hindus or the Muslims and the Black Rock in Mecca. There's lots of um, examples of, uh, or, or, or even Muhammad's tomb in Medina. There's lots of examples we can point to of idolatry. Uh, okay, can you please explain the difference between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text? So, yeah. Um, so the Septuagint was a Greek, a Jewish Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that happened, I think it was about 200 or 300 years before Christ. Someone can correct me on the dates. Whereas the Masoretic text was it or is a Hebrew text. The, the problem is that the Masoretic text, um, our earliest copies of it, I don't think get much past the early medieval period. Um, and that means that in terms of their textual continuity, they're very relate. A lot of a lot of texts have been lost. Um, whereas you see a continuity of um, the Old Testament written in Greek. Now, when in the Roman world, because of the Hellenizing influence of Alexander the Great, um, the, the, the lingua franca of the Roman world was Greek and Jews in the diaspora to whom the first apostles went were not using Hebrew, they were using the Septuagint. And so when the church, when you read about Paul disputing with the Jews or any of the apostles disputing with the Jews uh, outside of um, outside of Israel, um, you should assume that they're using the Septuagint to do that disputing, to do those arguments. And so the Septuagint became the standard Old Testament for um, the early church. Um, so I hope that answers your question, bro. All right, let's go and see. And, and so Christians are free. Christians are free to use either greek or hebrew we've got there's no there's no rule about which we can use we're at liberty to use both and actually i think especially with the discovery of um the dead sea scrolls um it makes sense to use as as wide a variety of manuscripts as possible um to make sure that we've got the most accurate rendering of the scripture into our native languages as we can. My day was great. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Or are we all done, guys? Because if there are no questions for me, then I'll end the live stream. You guys seem to be caught up in your... Um... Is it really true that you are pro-death penalty person? Please answer and elaborate. So I'm not pro death penalty i'm just not against the death penalty in every case i think that there's nothing in scripture that would um forbid the idea of the death penalty um i think that there are some crimes um that could require the death penalty um and the, but they would be the most heinous acts it would be kind of like you know, SS officers in the Waffen SS or in the groups that used to go and just mass murder civilians. It would be jihadis that go and blow up churches um, or, or, or run into churches and, and shoot up the place. Um, and anyone else who does that, by the way. Um, and that would include, for instance, the New Zealand um, mosque shooter. Um, and so I think in the most extreme crimes, um, uh, the death penalty may be justified. However, the thing is, within 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 secular Christian law, um, Christians are free to debate and to argue about how Christian principles apply in the secular world. Um, and, and there isn't, there doesn't have to be a universality behind that. Um, so, for instance, when Justinian did his reformation of, of Roman law, he introduced huge swathes of Christianity in that reformation um, to create Roman law. Um, 
that different emperors tweaked that law over time. Um, if you look at the Latin West, different kings had different secular laws, even though they were all Christian. And the reason for that is because they were thinking about Christian principles. They were thinking about Christian values. They were thinking about Christian goals. And they were, they were deciding with fear and trembling, working out what that meant in terms of legal application. And they came to different conclusions. That's not a problem. Um, and before any Muslim tries to boast, I wouldn't, because if you look at your schools of fiqh, your schools of fiqh have disagreements over just about everything. Um, and, and some of them are pretty weighty issues, like whether um, you can have an abortion or not. Um, so, or, or, or how you divorce someone. I mean, these are not small things. Um, so, as a Christian, I've I've been won over to the idea that in certain circumstances, the death penalty um, could apply. But that doesn't mean that every Christian has to agree with me, because you've got to. We we're all working with the same um, ingredients or the same blocks, um, but we may build those blocks into different shapes um, in the way that we apply. Um, our understanding of the faith and that also in, uh, is true of law as well okie dokie so any other questions for me or are you guys just having your own conversation let's have a look are you really on sunday my son speaker corner um i'm guessing you're asking me if i'm at speaker's corner this sunday um no i won't be at speaker's corner this sunday uh, i've got a family do to go to please put at bob that is not at bob um however i did spot it so i'll i'll do it but please put at bob not so it, it just makes it easier for me to see um what do you think about jews who have forsaken the bible and have the talmud which is the 12th century islam the rabbis are untouchable like islamic imams i think that um i think that for me, Jews obviously need to come to repentance. They need to come to a place of accepting um, the Messiah. Um, and I think it would be interesting if sadly it's not one of those issues that we really got in touch with, or, or we did slightly touch on it with um, Dr. Brown, which is this idea that um, where the Talmud contradicts the spirit or the word of scripture or where the talmud um or where the talmud goes far beyond what is required in scripture i i don't believe that those traditions need to be kept however i do agree um with what dr brown said about the fact that every culture and every group creates their own traditions and customs around what they believe Christian churches do it as well. We call it churchianity. Um, and not all churchianity is bad. And if you think that all tradition and custom built around your faith is bad, then you're a really poor Bible student. Um, but, but just as with our churchianity, it needs to be under constant review because there is this interface between um, scriptural injunction on one hand and cultural circumstances and needs on the other and these two enter into an interface and it's in that interface discipleship occurs and discipleship exists um so as circumstances and situations change discipleship needs to change with it even though the word of god is unchanging and the message of god is unchanging and so the jews also have um built up traditions and customs and where they can't fit into the new covenant that christ himself establishes then that needs to be thrown away as dross but where they are compatible with discipleship in christ then the jews have a culture which is jewish and they have every right to practice that just like I, as a Saxon, have the right to practice a Saxon culture or 
someone who's um, a Frank has the right to practice a Frankish culture or someone who's a Zulu has the right to practice Zulu culture and so on and so forth. Okay, let's have a look. I hope that answers your questions, bro. Any more questions for me, please do put at Bob. Okay. Thank you for answering me. I understand we all do it as a human thing, but Muslims do it more with the rock they kiss and that silly house they dance around. I just said Jew. Well, the the, the truth is that we all do it. Um, and I suspect, Ronnie, you do it. And as a Christian, the, the New Testament injunction to free yourself from idolatry is just as strong as anything in the Old Testament. But the idolatries that the church create and the idolatries that Christians have opened themselves up to are, are, are of a more subtle nature. nature. And, and Reformed Christians particularly, because they you know, did away with iconography and um, and 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 other visual descriptions. The, if if a reformed Christian is going to fall into idolatry, it's usually nationalism, um, and actually, it's that's true of the Orthodox Church as well. Nationalism is one of the biggest idols that the church struggles with. Nationalism is one of the biggest idols um, that permeates the church, and and I would say that the second biggest idol. The church that permeates the church that we have to smash is the the idolatry of self, the idolatry of me um, as an individual, as as a focal point of my own religiosity. This 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 is also a great idol um, that we often fall into danger of, and I would say that one of the best ways to avoid those idols is to refocus and to recenter your activism and your energy on building up the church because the church is the body of Christ and therefore to serve the church is to serve Christ. And, and if your energy is towards the church rather than towards the nation, if it's towards the church rather than towards the self, I think it's a good way of freeing yourself from those idols. Um, okay. What do you think about Jews who have forsaken the Bible? Okay, we've already dealt with that question. Why are you guys not got many questions today? Let's have a look. Um, like you, I believe in evolution. How do you square evolution with Genesis, which I can't do? I'm new to Christianity, having been an atheist for decades, and this is a real issue for me. Well, I, 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 I square it in the same way that origin of... Uh, Alexandria does in First Principles. Now, Origen is a church writer. He's not a church father because he got too much wrong. Um, but he taught, he he mocks, actually, those who take um, Genesis literally. Um, and he gives examples as to why he does that. Um, and the Alexandrian school of theology that grew up in the Alexandrian tradition of theology emphasized the allegorical over the, 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 the literal reading of scripture. Um, and, and, and the truth is that we are reading Genesis a lot of the time through a scientific paradigm, a scientific paradigm that did not exist when Genesis was written. Genesis was given at the time of the Exodus event. So it was given to a people who were backward, brutalized, barbaric slaves. Um, and these people had been washed with and soaked in four centuries um, polytheism. And, and so in Genesis, you, you, you would be better to read Genesis as a polemic against Egyptian polytheism more than you would read it as an actual reading of history in terms of how the universe came to be. Now, it is obviously teaching truths about how the universe came to be. And there are some beautiful similarities between what it says in Genesis and, and what we've learned in science. Um, but there's no, but, but it isn't a scientific textbook. It doesn't pretend to be a scientific textbook. 
the idea of reading it like it's science or reading it like it's history, um, it, it, it just doesn't fit the genre itself. Um, it would be better to be read in the genre of myth, in the sense of classical myth. Um, but classical myth wasn't understood by classical people as not being true. It was it was because it was communicating archetypes. It was communicating truth in, in every word, and and that is exactly what I believe Genesis is doing. Christians who are trying to make it into a scientific textbook are doing so because they live in a scientific paradigm, and so they think that they have to. Um, but the reality is that Genesis wasn't written for people in a scientific paradigm, and so it wasn't trying to address scientific questions. Um, and so we're misreading Genesis, I think, when we when we try to read it as literal history. Please put at Bob if you want me to answer your questions. Um, if you just put in Bob, I might miss it. So please put at Bob. And if there are no more questions, I will close the live stream. OK, let's have a look. OK. Bob of speakers, Luke's like Turkey is trying to recreate the Ottoman Empire with what's happening in Europe today. Yes, um, Erdogan is an Islamist. Erdogan has dreams of reviving the Ottoman Empire and our naive, the, the naive leaders of the EU and the naive leaders of NATO and the naive leaders of the West um, just refuse to see the danger that Erdogan is, a, a danger to Greece, a danger to Cyprus, a danger to Bulgaria, a danger to, the, to Eastern Europe. The, the, the guy is using the West, um, and he's using the West um, because the West is, is led by these weak, weak liberals who um, are frightened of conflict. Um, they have an ideological blind spot, which means that they literally cannot see Islamist ideology, even when it's slapped bang in front of them. You know, the most sympathetic interpretation is you can try to imagine that they're trying to outlive Erdogan. But the reality is they can't outlive Islamist ideology. They can only oppose Islamist ideology. The Turkish state is guilty of the genocides of Syrians, of Armenians, and of Greeks. Um, anyone who goes to Turkey is essentially going to the Nazi Third Reich. You're going to a state that is directly the continuity of the state that carried out a genocide, multiple genocides, um, and has desecrated the Church of the Hagia Sophia. The world talks about, you know, the Israel-Palestine conflict, but what about the occupation of northern Cyprus and the ethnic cleansing and religious cleansing of Orthodox Greek uh, Christians from northern Cyprus that still is happening today? Um, it has never paid reparations for any of the genocides. And so we should have a more robust attitude against the Turkish state. And I, I say Turkish state deliberately because there are lots of Turks that are against Erdogan, and we shouldn't forget that. What we should be doing is trying to support those Turks who are against Erdogan. Um, but more, more than anything else, we should be supporting the Christian community inside Turkey, regardless of its denomination. We should be supporting Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, who are living inside Turkey because they're living in a hostile environment, a hostile environment created by the Islamists that the liberals like to pretend are not there. Okay, rant over, moving on. Okay, guys, let's have a look. Well, we need to put stronger laws on Islamic, Arabic, Muslims who enter our country, they're a poison. Well, I, firstly, I want to correct you. Uh, I don't think you should mix ethnicity with religion. That's the mistake that liberals do. Um, this is not about picking on Muslim Arabs or even Islamist Arabs. It, it's about 
it's about dealing with Islamists because the liberal state, as, as we have evidenced and documented over six years at Speaker's Corner, the liberal state is allowing Islamists to operate unchecked, unchallenged. There is no um, pushback from liberals culturally against Islamists because they're making the mistake that you've just made. They're confusing ethnicity and religion as if it's the same thing. Um, we do need to create robust, strong laws that make it impossible for Islamists to operate. But the reality is we can only create those robust, strong laws if we abandon liberalism, if we, um, if we abandon the, um, the, the, the ideology of the Enlightenment, because it is precisely the ideology of the Enlightenment that has allowed um, the Islamists to take root in Europe. And the only way that we can abandon that is if we have another narrative to organize our lives around. And this is what I call a muscular Christianity, which is the kind of Christianity that existed in Europe before the Enlightenment. Um, the kind of Christianity that has beaten jihad before. The kind of Christianity that never allowed jihadis to take root. Um, and that's the kind of Christianity that we need now. It's not about it's not about it's not about trying to recreate the past. It's trying to it's about trying to learn from the past and build a different future. But that starts with each of you rejecting the Enlightenment and understanding where the Enlightenment stops and Christianity begins. It's about understanding that that the ideas that have emerged from the Enlightenment um, are not intrinsically Christian ideas and therefore they don't need to be defended by Christians and we should reassess as Christians where what parts what good or bad things we want to keep from the enlightenment and what good or bad things we want to get rid of because like with every culture it, it should find its truth in Christ and needs to be filtered by Christ so there are things to, that have come out of the enlightenment that can fit into the new covenant and there are things that have come out of the Enlightenment that cannot fit into the New Covenant, and we must get rid of those things that cannot fit into the New Covenant that we, the people of God, have to follow. The thing about the Enlightenment is that it, 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 it secured Christianity as a lukewarm, half-hearted, half-committed faith that served the state. And the church on the whole, ended up accepting that settlement, that we should have a lukewarm, tepid Christianity that, that's, that, that is on the back burner, um, that's timid, um, private, and not um, confrontational, um, and, and serves the good of the state. I call upon Christians openly to reassess whether that's where the church should be, whether that's what the church should be and whether that is how the church should behave. Okay, that's the second time I've seen you use foul language. So I am gonna put you on a timeout. But Peter, if you carry on using those kinds of descriptions in my chat, I am going to kick you out and you won't be allowed back in. Okay, uh, let's have a look. Okay, any other questions for me? How long after the death and resurrection of Christ did Paul have his vision? Oh, good question. I am not sure, but um, I think if memory serves me correct, it's within five years. So within five years of the resurrection of our Lord, Paul has this vision. And, and the things that you've got to realize, guys, is Paul was a persecutor of the church. For him to come over in the way that he did, for him to become a Christian because of a, a supernatural experience in which he um, has an encounter with the risen Jesus is a very powerful evidence, not only for the sincerity of his own um, conversion, but also for the truth of the resurrection itself. That's actually one of the, the key pointers, the key 
indisputable facts of history that point towards the reality of the resurrection. A man who was persecuting the church, who was set upon killing Christians, a man who sought to, um, to make life difficult for Christians, he um, then becomes one of its chief apostles. He then becomes one of its chief evangelists. And he did so precisely because he had a supernatural experience of the risen Jesus. Now, historians, you know, can dispute and do dispute what was the nature of the experience that he had. But there aren't any historians that deny that Paul had an experience that convinced him personally that Jesus rose from the dead. And that, my friends, is a very powerful argument for the resurrection. And it is a reason why I invite you to believe in the resurrection if you don't already. Any other questions for me? Let's have a look. And you guys are going on. What's... I hope you're all behaving in the chat. If there are any admins, I hope you're kicking out the trolls. Let's have lost any questions. Bear with us. Nope. So what we got? I have to flick down through this quickly, which is why I, I asked you to put at Bob so that I can see that you are talking to me. Um, going back to your view on muscular Christianity, would you support, for example, a security company for Christians, by Christians, to guard Christian businesses and churches? Yes, 100%. Absolutely, I would. Um, it can be done completely legally. Um, there's no law against it, um, and it, it, it is something that, as we are seeing the secular state increasingly fail to restrain the hand of, of Islamist thugs and to lose control um, of left-wing political violence, um, as we're seeing in America, as we're seeing in the UK, Christians need to organise legally. I, I stress this. I can't stress it enough. Um, legally. We need to organize for our own security. We can do that. There are legal routes that we can take and we should take them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not advocating anything against the law. I'm not advocating vigilantism. I'm, I'm saying that use the fullness of the scope that the law permits you to do. Um, but this, this would only work. It would work best, rather, if Christians followed the Benedict option. And... The, the, this debate in some way around the Benedict Option that I keep trying to get started amongst Christians, I'm going to win that debate in the fullness of time anyway, because you, the, the church will either dissolve and disappear and die, or it will adopt the Benedict Option. Sociologically, those are your options. Sociologically, the church either evaporates from the West or it adopts the Benedict Option. Um, it, it's that there, there isn't a better model out there and the ones that we're using um, are failing, evidently, undeniably failing. Um, but the Benedict option would allow Christians to set up legally secure, their own security firms, their own security uh, businesses to take care of their own community as an extra layer. Um, and yes, I, I fully support. I fully support doing it via good legal routes. Me and my wife have different religious beliefs. We got married both Christian, but she has become an unbeliever. I need advice. We love each other, but is this too big? Hmm. So. It's kind of like the reverse of the situation that the first Christians met. So what would happen amongst the first Christians is that you'd have this couple that were both pagans and then one of them would become Christian. And Paul always encouraged the person to stay in the marriage because uh, through them, the partner might be saved. Um, and, and so Paul didn't encourage people to divorce just because um, one had become a believer and, and the other one remained an unbeliever. But he did say that if they left you, i.e. the unbeliever left the believer, 
then the believer has done no wrong. So if the, the unbeliever divorces the believer, um, they have done no wrong. And so I, I would encourage you the same. I would encourage you to stay in the marriage. I would encourage you to continue to be a faithful and loving husband. Um, I would encourage you to continue to, you know, um, where opportunity provides um, to evangelize your missus um, and, and hope to win her back to the faith. Um, if she divorces you, um, which God forbid that that happens, but if she divorces you, you have done no wrong. Um, but but the other thing is, you know, a prophet is never heard amongst his own in his own town, amongst his own people. It might be the case that young squire that that you can't say anything to her that would convince her because you're too close to her. So maybe introduce her to a good evangelist a good speaker, a good representative of the Christian faith who might be able to, to communicate the truths that she just can't hear from you because you're too close. Um, and and I, I really want to encourage Christians to do this, all of you who watch this. I connect and network with the good evangelists in the body of Christ and, and people that you're evangelizing, take them to the evangelists because it, or, or, or network with the evangelists and, and let the evangelists help you. Because the reality is that we've got a disconnect within the body of Christ at the moment. The evangelists go and do their evangelism and then everyone else just sits back and either does none or does their own thing independently. And the people with all the experience are just doing their own. Every Christian should be connected to an evangelist. Every Christian should be connected and either learning from or taking people to the good evangelists that they know. And so I do put this invite out to everybody. If you are evangelizing someone and I can help you do that, get in touch. Willa can either do it via Zoom or if you're in London, we can do it in person. Or if you want to bring them down to the corner and we'll talk at the corner. But yeah, I'm happy to evangelize anyone that you're evangelizing with. When you've taken that conversation as far as you can take it, um, take it to the evangelist so that they can take it further. I hope that helps you, bro. Um, sadly, I, I, um, we should pray for this, brother. You know, that's not a great position to be in. I, I would just say as one final thought before I move on on that, is that wherever she adopts a Christian position, double down on it and 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 laud her applaud her and praise her for adopting any christian position because if there's enough things in your marriage that are still christian in terms of values and goals and, and so on and so forth and attitudes that marriage could still work and it keeps the bridges open by which she might return to the faith What minimal facts of the resurrection are so strongly attested historically that they are granted by nearly every scholar who studies the subject, even the rather sceptical ones? What well, good question. So um, that Christ was crucified, that the that the, the, the his first followers who knew he had died um had an experience that convinced him that he had risen from the dead, that this experience did transform them um, and that they went on to preach about this resurrection, even, yeah, yeah um, that Christ was buried in a tomb. Now that one, that there'll be some pushback from some, but actually there's really good grounds to believe that Christ was buried in a tomb. Um, that um let me just think that this transformative effect meant that and this is something where i, I didn't want to sort of push back too much with with dr michael brown while he was here because i had so many questions to ask him and i didn't want to get caught up in a debate that would suck up all the time but one of the things that i would have maybe um tickled uh, dr brown's mustache over is the fact that, um, you know, the, the, it, it seems in Scripture that Sundays did become a day of worship for Christians. 
that they would gather and break bread. And that breaking of bread, I understand to be communion. Um, and so I would say that Sunday did become a, a day of worship. Um, I'm happy to go along with Dr. Michael Brown in saying that they didn't maybe see it as a Sabbath, um, but they did see it as a, as a special day. And, and that's transformative because uh, that's particularly powerful because there's no Jewish reason. There's no mosaic Jewish reason to to make Sundays a special day, but it's undeniable that Sundays did become a special day. And that actually is probably why Gentile Christians then went on to establish Sunday as a Sabbath, because the Jewish believers introduced to them the idea that Sunday was a special day. When in the Roman world, no one thought Sunday was a special day. Um, so that that's a, a thing that points to the reality of the resurrection. Um, I forgot where I'm up to. The fact that Paul, who was an enemy of the faith and a persecutor of the faith, then becomes a Christian. The fact that James, who uh, was a doubter of Jesus, the brother of Jesus, then becomes a Christian and these become leaders of the church. These are the kinds of, um, and, and the fact that many of the, these followers are known to have gone on and died for their faith, like Paul, um, I believe James as well, um, I'm pretty sure James, um, you know, and Peter, undeniable um, historically that, that these characters uh, went on to die. We can't verify all the martyrdoms, but we have a reason um, to, to accept the other martyrdoms based on the ones that we can verify. And so the, these are the kinds of facts that, that, that point to the resurrection. I haven't listed them all. Um, there's 12 altogether. I do do a video on my channel. I think there's a short on my channel that does it as well. Um, but these are the facts that even skeptics concede as, as being realities. And they all point to um, the resurrection. For me, it, it, one of the powerfulists it, 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 powerful, powerfulest. One of the most powerful is that um, is that even skeptics don't deny that something was experienced by the first Christians that made them um, believe that Christ had risen from the dead. Okay. Uh, how do you become a Christian? Serious question. Thank you, Wayne. If you're ready to become a Christian. Um, I can I can lead you in a prayer right now, um, and and that prayer is is basically a commitment to Christ. I mean, it, it's essentially to pray. Among certain groups, they believe that you have to say the sinner's prayer, but there's there's nothing biblical about that. You don't have to say a sin, the sinner's prayer. That's just a prayer that lots of Christians use. But essentially, the way you become a Christian is you say a prayer. You say it with sincerity of heart and, and you basically commit your life to being a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, and that in that prayer, however you say it, that you that you accept Christ as your Lord and as your savior. And when you say that prayer, you've become a Christian. And then the journey goes on from there to a point um, that we call baptism and at baptism you are declaring to the people of God to people like me that that prayer that you said however long ago was a serious thing that you that you want to now as it were make it seal it as it were um, as your entire way of life and you are baptized in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and it has to be in that formula um and then and then your journey as a christian is complete um you're sealed and you're now part of the people of god um you're part of the covenant as it were and you 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 then continue as a disciple so if i see another message from you saying that you want to become a christian on air we'll say a prayer together um but if not that's how you do it and feel free to get in touch with me. My email is btbsoco at gmail.com. I'll happily talk with you if you're in London, meet with you and, um, you know, 
continue this conversation um, further. Okie dokie. Let's have a look. Uh, what are the key pieces of scriptural support for OEC interpretation? I'm afraid, bro, my mind is drawing a blank on what you mean by OEC. Um, OEC. No, nope, I can't figure out what you're trying to tell me. So I'm afraid I can't answer your question. Very sorry. Um, you'll have to put OEC into words. Um, I'm just drawing a blank for the moment. OEC. Oriental, Eastern. Nope. It's not energy's essence. Nope. Sorry, bro. I, I just don't know what you mean by OEC. So I can't help you. Um, I, I'm not an encyclopedia. Uh, Jimmy, ask your question again. But do put at Bob. Please put at Bob so I can see that you are talking to me. Um, you're lucky, even though you didn't put at Bob. Do I think people... Do I think... Pe do, yeah, yes is the answer to the question. I think people can lose their salvation. Um, you know, not every Christian agrees with that position um, and they have their reasons, but I think that it is possible for someone to have sincere faith and make a sincere commitment and then somewhere down the line decide to chuck all of that in the bin. Um, so, yeah, I believe that. And the reason why I believe it is that in, I think it's in Corinthians or that there is a passage in scripture where um, one of the apostles is saying, you know, can, can Christ be crucified again? And it's very clear from that passage that, Christ, that the apostle is speaking about people that he thinks have had sincere faith. And so, yes, I believe that that um, people can be, can lose their faith, um, can lose their salvation. Um, let me just see if I can find that passage for you. Bear with us one second. And I would say also that actually, you know, the church fathers are you almost unanimous on the idea that someone can lose their salvation. Um, so it's in, maybe it's in Hebrews then, possibly. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. So just go there. I've got a better setup now. I've got a little stand from a Bible. Um, Hebrew 6, 4 to 6. Hopefully you can still hear me. I'll pull this a bit closer now. I don't need the notepad. Hebrew 6, 4 to 6. For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away. So I think that's pretty conclusive. Um, what, what the apostle is saying. Um, John Chrysostom says this. Let us be humble. Let us all be humble. Our own our own souls by alms giving and forgiving our neighbors their trespasses by not remembering injuries or avenging ourselves if we continue to reflect on our sins no external circumstances can make us elated neither riches nor power nor authority nor honor so one of the one of the chief ways to guard yourself against falling away is to protect your heart against bitterness, to protect your heart against hopelessness, to protect your heart against disappointment um, or the dis disappointment of your own ambitions. Um, and, and yeah, to fix your eyes on Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. The reality is everyone's going to disappoint you, including me at some point. If I haven't already, I'm sure I will. Um, anyway. Let us press on. Um, 
if that's your view, why do you think God didn't talk about evolution in Genesis? Right. Well, if I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I the, 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 the reason why is if I was to bring on, and I have actually, I once had a panel full of scientists on my live stream and they were talking about hard science and they were talking about um, the the environmental uh, crisis and they were talking about the fact of global warming. Uh, they had science. These were all people with PhDs, um, but most of my audience couldn't understand what they were saying, you know, um, couldn't engage with what they were saying. Um, you know, there's no criticism there. It's just the reality. If someone speaks about something that's outside of your box, you know, if, it, if someone's talking about something that you're not used to talking about, it takes a while for you to get it. it. It's kind of like learning a new language. You know, if I started speaking in Spanish, um, unless you spoke Spanish, you wouldn't understand what I was saying. Or if I started speaking in Latin, you wouldn't understand what I was saying. Well, ideas, particularly complicated ideas, can also function in a similar kind of way because they develop their own language. The, the, the Jews and everyone in the world at that time would never have been in a place to have understood the complexities of uh, genetic differentiation um, from generation to generation. It, it would have, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have meant anything to them, um, but rather to use the kind of cultural stories with which they're already familiar, and to use the narratives with which they're already familiar but then to demonstrate in those narratives that there is only one God and he is the creator of all things that communicated to them. So, yeah, um, again, you're assuming that the scientific paradigm is the end point of history and it's not the scientific paradigm. I'm sure will get replaced with something else at some point. Um, I don't know what, but probably will maybe already is because we're seeing with progressive wokeists um that these guys are <laughs> accusing mathematics of being racist and denying um obvious genetic uh, facts that should not be denied such as the idea that there are males and females so we might actually be moving into a post scientific age we've certainly got the rumblings of it but who knows what the next paradigm will be um how long we've done that question. So any other questions? Dr. James Tor says evolution is impossible. He's a Jewish follower in Jesus and says top scientists in private say they can't fit evolution into life. And Dr. James Tor has a PhD in chemistry and biology. I'm not going to comment. I, I think that if Dr. James Tor had some really knockdown argument on evolution, he'd probably be in Times Magazine. Um, the fact that he isn't makes me think that he probably hasn't got the kind of knockdown argument that he he's proclaiming himself to make. Um, the reality is that, that the scientific community um, has its philosophies and and has its kind of um, its devotions to ideas, but if you can come up with solid evidence or solid argument about something, you can flip that over. Um, that's one of the reasons why science works is because it, it can change its its materialistic model um, of, of its understanding of the world. Um, but that which is evidenced and uh, empirically observed doesn't disappear from the new paradigm the new the new idea it just gets enfolded into it you know, like enfolded into it um like isaac newton gets enfolded into einstein so i'm um, i'm afraid that just because dr james tor says that doesn't mean that i necessarily agree um yeah so there you go for me, though, this is not the most important thing to be talking about. I think there's far, far more important questions um, to be discussing in our society than 
and 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 for the church to be discussing than this question uh, and i say that we love paul you know it's like feel free not to believe in evolution i'll have fellowship with you i'll break bread with you we'll go out and evangelize um you know it, it it's not that important a much bigger question is how are we going to create families in the church when we're not having families how are we going to do that guys how are we going to help our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted around the world what are we going to do about that guys how are we going to recapture our institutions from the progressive militants that have taken them over how are we going to do that guys how are we going to um end centuries of division over hardly anything now even if you're a protestant who thinks i can't have communion with catholics well take this principle and apply it to the protestant churches you know or if you're orthodox apply it to the orthodox churches or if you're catholic just apply it to the catholic church there's divisions everywhere how are you going to help to end those divisions rather than make them greater there are so many other questions that are far more important um, than the question of evolution um yeah however you know so i'm not interested in convincing anyone the only time I ever talk about this is because people ask me. Dr. Brown elaborated on the freedom of Gentile and Jewish Christians. What else would you like to discuss with Dr. Brown or other Messianic Jews? Um, I would like to have discussed more, um, particularly, you know, things that, that Messianic Jews can teach the Gentile church and things that perhaps Messianic Jews need to learn from the Gentile church. Like he spoke about more about rediscovering the Jewish roots of the church. And I think that's absolutely sound thinking, but I would have loved to have tried to elaborate and pad it out um, what that looked like. Um, let me just get my pen and paper. Like there were lots of other things, um, you know, I, I wanted to talk to, I'd love to talk to him more about Trinity in the Torah um, and belief in the Trinity. Um, I, I would have loved to have talked to him more about um, like the, you know, the, the fact that the, it was actually the Jews that it was, it was non-Messianic Jews that kicked the Messianic Jews out of the church and, and how that actually ruptured the church. You know, it's not all the Gentiles fault um, though, obviously, in the grand path of history, we've certainly got a lot more to answer for. Um, you know, and, and also the fact that the, the, the church has to be, just numerically, it's got to be, um, it's going to be Gentile, because um, there's just more Gentiles than there are Jews. And I, I don't feel that he really connected, landed, and some of the questions that I asked him, um, he didn't really manage to land on i don't know what that's like when you're asking a multi-pointed question you can miss a point and so if i'd had more time i would have pressed some of the points that he missed such as you know how when it's a a giant gentile church with a sprinkling of messianic jews you know how does that interface work what does it look like um, I would have loved to have discussed those kinds of questions. And then I would have loved to have discussed um, separately, not in this conversation. I would have loved to have discussed um, Israel, Palestinian Christians, Messianic Christians, our relationships, and, and where, do, where should Christians stand in the Israel-Palestine conflict? Um, those kinds of questions. So... Guys, I, I hope you enjoyed today's live stream. I hope it is a blessing to you. Um, the brother who asked about how you become a Christian, please do get in touch with me if you're wanting to become a Christian. I really do would love to talk with you some more. Um, however, it's time to bring this to a close. And so let us end with a prayer. Benedi Anamime. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all of thy sin, 
and healeth all thine infirmities, who saveth thy life from destruction, and crowneth thee with mercy and loving kindness, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, making thee young and lusty as an eagle. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all them that are oppressed with wrong. He should his ways unto Moses, his works unto the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, long-suffering and of great goodness. He will not always be chiding, neither keepeth he his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For Luke, how high the heaven is in comparison of the earth, so great is the mercy also towards them that fear him. Luke, how wide also the east is from the west, so far hath he set our sins from us. Yea, like as a father pitieth his own children, even so is the Lord merciful unto them that fear him. For he knoweth whereof we are made, he remembereth that we are but dust. The days of man are but as grass, for he flourisheth, uh, for he flourisheth as a flower of the field. For as soon as the wind goeth over it, it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endureth forever and ever upon them that fear him, and his righteousness upon children's children even upon such as keep his covenant and think upon his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his seat in heaven and his kingdom ruleth over all. O oh, praise the Lord, ye angels of his, ye that excel in strength, ye that fulfill his commandments and hearken unto the voice of his words. Praise the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye servants of his that do his pleasure. O oh, speak good of the Lord, all ye works of his, in all places of his dominion. Praise thou the Lord, O oh, my soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.